some of the impact of what is imposed from the Western banks and what that does in Egypt. Uh, of course, there's also the impact of, of Western culture and the way in which that filters through, which you've written and thought on a lot. So, so maybe you can really combine those uh, two questions. But certainly Egypt, with such a glorious history and such enormous resources, has ended up completely impoverished. And just in asking the question, one thing where this really hit me was when they talked about Mubarak having $70 billion outside of Egypt in secret bank accounts. And I looked up and, and what is the total uh, Egyptian foreign debt? Huge, huge. It was $37 billion. <laughs> so it means that if Mubarak alone, let alone his children and his whole entourage and family and all that the billions that they stole were, were returned, not only could the foreign debt be totally repaid, but, but much more could, could happen. But it does show what, how much is extracted. And then it sits in Western banks for, for use, you know, for use of the bankers. Mm -hmm. uh, but to talk about some of the impact in yes. Egypt, um, please. Yes. Uh, uh, that's why the Western power, the capitalists, the capitalist imperialist powers unite to abort any socialist revolution. And they use religion to abort it. And if I go back to amnesia, uh, we should revive our memory of history. I think creativity is very much related to memory, to remember. We have to train our memory to remember history very much to avoid mistakes of the past. In fact, uh, I was astonished when I read that Mubarak has more than $60 billion in Western banks, in Germany, in Britain, in the United States, and they were cooperating and supporting him all the time, and they know that. And if you go back in history to the Iranian revolution and compare it to the Egyptian, how they aborted. The Iranian revolution started, I was in Iran three times before Khomeini came, before the revolution. And I was invited to the university, I met young people, I was young at that time, and they were talking about the revolution exactly like the young men and women in Egypt were talking before the revolution. And I used to meet them in my home and contact them. And the Iranian young men and women were very secular, socialist. They were, uh, Mossadegh was their hero who nationalized the oil and was punished by the capitalist, imperialist powers. And they were dreaming, like us in Egypt, to free Iran. And the Shah was working for the West. And they wanted to get rid of the Shah and of American imperialism and to free the oil, the oil to be to the Iranians, and to get rid of the religious groups. So it was a secular, socialist revolution. And to end the poverty, because when you have imperialism and colonialism, you have poverty, of course, like in Egypt. We have more than 45% of the people under the poverty line with $2 a day. And this is the effect of, of uh, neocolonialism. We became an American colony. We cannot produce our food. We cannot produce our wheat. We have to import from the US. Anyway. So what happened that the Iranian revolution, millions in the streets, they were dreaming of freedom, dignity, social justice, independence, exactly like the Egyptians. Then ha what happened? Khomeini came from Paris on a plane to Iran. And many people were not aware of that at that time. And they thought, Yes, they thought that Khomeini is very working for Iran, and he aborted 
Khomeini was used by the Western capitalist imperialist powers to abort the secular socialist revolution in Iran and turn it religious. Why? Because of this, the money, the imperialist and the capitalist real enemy is not religious revolution. It is a secular socialist revolution. This is the fear. The same with Egyptian revolution. After it was secular and socialist and young men and women were uh, shouting for uh, justice, dignity, equality between people, eradication of poverty and unemployment, ending colonialism, etc. Suddenly we find a new Khomeini, his name is Yusuf al-Qaradawi, a sheikh who came to Tahrir Square and he spoke to the millions who sent him. He came by a plane, <laughs> he exactly like Khomeini, and spoke and all his language was religious. In the Egyptian revolution, we didn't have one Islamic slogan. Nobody remembered religious slogans. It was all social justice, dignity, freedom, independence. So now they want to abort the secular socialist revolution in Egypt to become religious, Islamic. And you know the process. They send somebody by a plane, then after that, the language became religious. The language started to be religious. The military started to speak about God, etc. So what's happening? So we have to be aware of that, and we have to remember history and to compare re revolutions. What happened to the revolution in the past in other countries, even to the French Revolution, the Iranian Revolution, the American Revolution to the Wisconsin uh, Revolution and all that and try to remember and understand and make the linkage bet on, between all that. Um, uh, Sarah told me something very nice a few days ago that in Wisconsin they said, walk like an Egyptian. Right now, in all the media, it's interesting how these things change so quickly. Uh, I want to go back to amnesia and, and memory and so on. Uh, after all these years of, of toasting and greeting and, and in every way raising up Mubarak, along with funding and arming and training um, the security services and, and the military, there has been a transformation in the U.S. press where they want us to believe that they were actually the great friends of this um, uh, revolutionary change and that they've put a great deal of focus on any of the young people who came here or the fact that they were using Twitter and Facebook and social networking and gee, those are all built in the US, you know, and, and therefore um, that somehow this was um, a U.S. creation, wanting to bring democracy to the region. So, uh, just to ask if you have uh, thoughts on both the next stages and uh, the the attitude of the U.S. and the forms of intervention that that they might take, and and ideas on how from below. Uh, demands can be raised that will strengthen this this new movement I think Sarah reminded me you know in Egypt when Mubarak was in power most of the writers uh, were praising him as a semi-god creative writers who wrote novels and he gave them prizes. The Mubarak, the big, the highest prize in Egypt carried the name of Mubarak. So most of them, they, he, he celebrated them and gave them prizes. Also journalists, editors in chief of Al Ahram, of the big newspapers, the media, television, they were, every, I was censored in the media of Egypt. I could not write in Al-Ahram or big 
newspaper, but they were writing with their photographs, and they were so proud. Mubarak just a few weeks before he, he resigned, there was a big photograph. He met with the best writers in the country, the best hypocrites, you know. <laughs> right, right. and a big photograph. He was in the middle and they were around him. Some of them were my friends, were, but I know them quite well. And then when Mubarak resigned, next day they changed. Next, they just overnight. They were the most, they, they had the, the loudest voice against Mubarak. It's like the U.S. The U.S. was supporting Mubarak 100% when the revolution and also those uh, writers and journalists were praising the revolution and putting it in like Mubarak, you know, the exaggeration. Praising the revolution more than my, than me, who participated in it, <laughs> you know. So the U.S. was also supporting Mubarak and Sadat. And then when the revolution won, and the young, 20 millions were in the streets, they shifted 180 degrees, and they started to criticize Mubarak and to show his money and to praise the revolution. Uh, so we need our memory, and people forget, people forget, very easily. So we have to remember, we keep reminding them. I wrote many articles in, our, in, in, in Cairo on this hypocrisy, and I said, uh, they are not ashamed to do that. No they are not ashamed. Why? <laughs> <laughs> no shame. No shame, no it's shame. very strange. And people for, forget and forgive. I don't know, but we have to remind, because uh, this is very important. To, people should be accountable, yes. you know, because usually uh, people under the so-called that you, you, be, you be forgiving others, to forgive the mistakes. I don't believe in that. There is a difference between to forgive and, uh, and to, to be accountable for your mistakes and for your crimes. So we have to be careful and we need, I think what we need now, because I don't want to forget that before I leave, there is no international body that punish people who make mistakes like that. The International Criminal Court never punished the big dictators and the big crimes of George Bush, the father, the son, or anywhere, or in the people in Israel. But they punish small dictators in Africa, you know? The United Nations Security Council, they never, never stand with the people who are killed. They stand with the big powers. So we, we have to think about that we, the people, should create a new international body to, so that those criminal, criminals, whether global or local, to be accountable. Right.